Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the open session of the uh, board on animal health sciences, conservation and research, our spring meeting. I am uh, Bob Disco. I'm one of the co-chairs for this fine, austere body with uh, Dr. Barbara Nat Natterson Horowitz as my co-chair. Um, and this afternoon, we're going to have two sessions uh, with several individuals, specialists in the area, talking about protecting the health of wild animals in the first session, and then protecting um, the health of companion animals in the second session. Uh, I will now turn it over to Dr. Suzanne Murray, who is the moderator for our opening session. Suzanne? Thank you, Bob. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, as part of BASCO's commitment to um, animal health sciences, care, research, and conservation, we are taking a deep dive into wildlife with this next uh, this next session. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of four guests, uh, who, that each of whom will be giving a presentation. We'll have time for two questions after each presentation, and then we've saved some time at the end for a um, a broader discussion. Uh, each of our panelists is very distinguished, comes from very different backgrounds, but yet has a lot to allow. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of areas to leverage. And I'm really excited about not only the presentations, but the discussions afterwards. I will introduce each person just before they speak. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Dr. Marcy Uhart from uh, University of California at Davis. She is a wildlife veterinarian with 30 years experience from Argentina and has a deep commitment to wildlife, especially um, marine mammals. And with that, I will, and penguins. With that, uh, I'll turn over to you, Marcy. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, and just apologies to all for my voice, but uh, I hope you can still hear me okay. So as soon as my slides are up, I'll, I'll get started. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and speaking with us, especially since speaking is so difficult. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to be um, briefly speaking about H5N1, highly pathogenic avian influenza in marine mammals. And I'll call this a conservation crisis, and I'll explain why. I can take control of my slides. There you go. So um, avian influenza viruses are one of several influenza A viruses that we give names to uh, through two of their protein surfaces, the hemagglutinins and neuraminidases. And basically these avian viruses are just this one component that normally circulates between uh, mostly waterfowl, that's their natural reservoir, but they're all they're also cycles and viruses specific to poultry and farmed um, domestic birds, as well as several species of mammals that have their own influenza viruses. And I lost my slides. I believe that uh, we'll be able to switch the slides for you. Is I cannot you? see them anymore. <laughs> that's my okay. problem. But okay. I Hang on one second. Um, Mariah, can you assist us with that? It just said that the host had changed. Can we give that back to Marcy? Moment, please. Just one moment. Thank you. Marcy, we're building in breaks for you to rest your voice. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. So, uh, the other characteristic of these viruses is that specifically for viruses that have this hemagglutinin of types H5 and H7, they can go through a process where they change some genes, especially in poultry settings where they acquire these mutations that um, change their pathogenicity. So that's when they become highly pathogenic. And basically what this means is that they go from being uh, mostly a, a, a digestive um, track virus to a systemic virus that usually has uh, neurological and uh, central nervous system impacts. Um, let me see if again this can go. Next, please. So 
I want to make this point that especially these highly pathogenic viruses are the ones that we're concerned and call One Health because these are the ones that can actually spill over between these other groups. The others, naturally, the low pathogenic viruses live within these all of these species more naturally, and each one has their own viruses. And the first time ever that we saw spillback of these highly pathogenic viruses from poultry where they emerged into wildlife again was in 1961 with the first outbreak in turns in South Africa. Next, please. So what there was, you know, this big period in between, but basically the other notable event that happened was in 1996 when the current virus uh, of Goose Guangdong lineage emerged in Guangdong, China in 1996. So there was during this period, normally what we do is try to contain these viruses and stop them from spreading and getting back into wildlife early on when they're, when they're this poultry setting, but that did not happen. This was in part related to this habit of free grazing of, of waterfowl, especially ducks and geese, uh, with, where they mix with um, wildlife. And from there, these viruses emerged. First, they were spreading around Asia. And then by 2005, they were already moving into Europe, then to Africa, and then uh, more so. Next, please. So in 2021, basically, we have the emergence of this new lineage within this H5N1 um, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus that we haven't been able to stop for the last 25 years. And this is the lineage 2344B. And this is basically a virus that has changed all the paradigms we knew about avian influenza. And I'll explain why that is the case. Next, please. So one of these key factors here is the loss of seasonality. So normally influenza viruses were very seasonal. They were come and go. They were, you know, present when the virus did well in the environment and could actually survive when there were birds aggregated and it could transmit. But basically, again, since 2021, the virus starts losing seasonality. This new strain manages to stay year round in these settings and spreading continuously. So we don't have this peace time to plan. And also there is no break for the wildlife. Next, please. And another interesting factor was that it started affecting big time uh, seabirds, especially, and that is really important because this is how densely aggregated these species are when they breed. These are black bar albatrosses from the Southwest Atlantic, but basically anywhere that we have seabirds, they tend to aggregate in these very highly dense colonies. Um, so the virus has an ideal setting to spread. But what this means also is that the virus is hitting the birds at the most critical stage of their life, which is when they're trying to breed and have the next generation. And for long-lived species like albatrosses, for example, that uh, are only mature when they're seven years old and then have one chick every three years, you can have a very significant impact if you kill them at breeding age. Next, please. The other factor that changed uh, with this new virus was that it, it really, really increased the number of species uh, from all the taxonomic groups of birds that it began to impact. So traditionally these viruses are with waterfowl and, and shorebirds especially, but now it's not only restrained to these groups of, of uh, birds and we see it in many, many different ones, including in many cases, the raptors. Um, or birds that prey because these are also um, infected through preying and scavenging. Next, please. And then another factor that is completely unusual is uh, how this virus has been able to spread into um, mammals, how it spilled over into mammals, unusual mammals for all that. And I want to point especially to the bottom part of the map because in South America, we have seen that mostly or almost exclusively the mammals affected are marine mammals, not the carnivores that we have seen in Europe and the and North America, where you have the bears, the skunks, the foxes, et cetera, the cats that are feeding on infected birds. But this is now spreading in South America amongst marine mammals. And then, of course, the, the cow in the room is the, the dairy cows in the United States, which again is a mammal that is infected through this virus, not directly involved or with a transmission that is not re directly related to 
feeding on infected prey. Next, please. And then uh, linked to that and everything else that we've been seeing, another factor that is unusual by, from this, by, uh, in this virus is that, th that it has spread globally to the point that as of February 2024, we have confirmation in Antarctica and continental Antarctica. It got to the South Antarctic Islands by October of last year. And basically nowadays, the only areas in the world in which we do not have confirmed cases is Oceania. So Australia, New Zealand, and some islands in the Pacific Ocean. Next, please. So, and the final point that distinguishes this, and I left it for the end because of what it means and how it relates to this specific session, is just the scale of the mortality that it's caused and the humongous conservation impact, something that we have never seen before. So we have seen uh, equal mortalities. This, these are examples from South America. We have seen also mortalities in the thousands in Europe, in Africa, and North America. Uh, but I want to point here that we're usually talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands for some of these species. So you can see here cormorants, boobies, uh, pelicans. I mean, it's tens of thousands of animals that we've lost. And for reference here, all the all the species that I've highlighted with red around them, those are endangered species. So there's another an added impact on the, the impact of, of the virus on each of these. Next, please. So the added impact in South America is completely unprecedented. Um, I suspect this will be continued to be the case in areas where the virus has never been before. We have never had highly pathogenic H5 in South America before, and we have lost way, way above half a million uh, birds um, from this from this virus of multiple species, again, multiple endangered species, in, you know, including several endangered cetaceans, marine birds, marine mammals, anything you can think of. And you know, again, humongous numbers that we have never seen before. And also in some cases affecting significant proportions. So the percentage of the population that died during these, ma these massive mortalities are very relevant. For example, we lost nearly 40% of the entire population of the endemic Peruvian pelican. Next, please. That is one outbreak. So then this became very close to me uh, last year when in October, um, we witnessed uh, the first mass mortality in a phocid species in the Southern hemisphere. These are all elephant seal carcasses. Well, there's one in the front there that is a sea lion, but this is what we saw on the beaches when the elephant seals aggregated for breeding. We lost basically every single pup that was born, 17,000 pups. Uh, based 95% of the colony, we had total reproductive failure due to the virus uh, during this mass outbreak last year. Next, please. So this is a reference of the photo. What we would see normally is just these beaches with breeding sea lions, uh, elephant seal, sorry, and harems. And then 2023, in contrast, on the side, empty beaches with nothing there once the carcasses were gone. Next, please. So I'll talk a little bit briefly about what this means for us trying to work on the ground and understand what's going on. So of course, we needed to document this and investigate these outbreaks. But of course, this is not without challenges. You're working in field settings in the middle of outbreaks, and nobody knows where they're coming from or how. Nobody knew exactly what samples to take. Again, this is a virus that is presenting in an unusual way. So the, or, the usual you know, two end swabs, the oral, the respiratory, the fecal, that's not working. So you need to dig into these carcasses and go for, for brain samples and many other things. We're seeing aborted fetuses. There's of course huge challenges in implementing full PPE and biosecurity when working in these settings. Aside from getting permits, because remember this is, and I didn't say it, this is an agriculture disease of mandatory reporting and it's also reportable um, for human cases as well, H5s and H7s are. So all of these diseases have to be, this virus has to be investigated as an agriculture uh, disease. So it creates huge issues for us trying to work in the wildlife sector, trying to investigate an outbreak more for understanding what's going on and for the conservation impacts than just to confirm is it H5 or not. Next, please. 
And then, of course, there are challenges in the uh, characterization of the virus. So getting these to a lab where we can actually do PCRs and confirmation very quickly and that we can do full genome sequences. So this creates a lot of challenges. Imagine a world where you do not have overnight FedEx, right? I have never had overnight FedEx in my entire life. Cold chain for me is a sign for nightmares. Uh, so it is really, really challenging to work in the settings that we do. Uh, so this is another factor that has to be considered. And it was really important for us to do this. And I'll talk to that a little bit more because we are seeing differences and we need to know the genetic characteristics of these viruses to understand evolution and also the risk of transmission, both to agriculture as well as to humans. Next, please. But uh, as important as these past challenges seem, uh, they actually the most, uh, the biggest challenges for, for South America were what to do with the carcasses because seabirds maybe can be disposed of. Those are the pictures here on the, on the right. And even though people messed up because they were spraying disinfectants on beaches, which you should not do, uh, you could still maybe dig a pit and dump uh, board carcasses there, which you cannot do with elephant seal carcasses. On the, on the left here, you have a photo. Those are all carcasses of baby elephant seals, but um, bull elephant seals, for example, are 3,000 kilos, so three tons of animal. You cannot dispose of these carcasses unless they're right in public beaches. So these are remote areas. And again, I'm talking tens of thousands of carcasses. So sometimes we think about the complexities of PCR, but we do not think about the complexities of reducing transmission by means such as carcass disposal and removal from the environment. Next, please. And then the other, another factor is that um, when, when the interpretations about how these events occur uh, are done in isolation from people on the ground with experience. They seem to happen in this vacuum where it's, uh, you know, it's like we found this virus, we found it here, you know, they're identical, then transmission happened this way and that way. But it is really important to understand the ecological context. So which species are prey, which species are scavengers, which species are predators, how do cetaceans get infected if, you know, when do they come in contact with birds? Maybe that happens on land with seals and sea lions, but that does not happen with cetaceans. So how is that infection and transmission happening? And this is where you need this ecological context. Next, please. And this is really important, again, because viruses, influenza viruses can adapt. They have all these mechanisms, and especially one that is really important is reassortment, where if, if, if one individual is infected with two different influenza viruses at the same time, these viruses can combine and create a new one that then is, for example, adapted to humans. And we saw that with the H1N1 2009 pandemic influenza strain that had a swine, a bird, and human viruses. Next, please. And uh, this is kind of what we were trying to get at in our investigations, and we're still working on this. And for example, one of the things that we're finding is that the virus is, go is moving on uh, within marine mammals, but then it's also uh, spilling back into birds. So we have mammal adapted viruses with mutations that make it adapted to mammals, uh, but then it's coming back to infect birds. So we need to understand that, you know, how does that relate maybe to the cow viruses that we're seeing now? How do these transmission events happen? And what, it, what are the implications of these multi-species outbreaks? Next, please. And this is also relevant because the only case that has happened in Chile and humans in early 2023 was attributed by the WHO uh, to environmental exposure. This person did not have contact with poultry uh, or birds of any case. Uh, he was just exposed uh, to many dead animals in, in the area where he lived. So again, we cannot rule out environmental exposure as another risk factor for humans. Next, please. So this is why uh, one of the key issues that I see now and that concerns me very much is the huge virus uh, bias that we have in surveillance and reporting. So if you look on the map on the left, I assure you this is from September last year to uh, end of January of this year. I assure you there were many more outbreaks in South America that are not reported there. 
Um, and this is what OFLU is using to monitor influenza outbreaks worldwide and to actually produce sequences for candidate vaccines for humans. And then on the map on the right, you have the how <laughs> what parts of the world are actually contributing sequences of the viruses also for candidate vaccines. The little dot on the red there is another reminder for me that that is one dot represents 17,000 dead elephant seals. So we also have a big problem with our denominators. We report each one of those as one case instead of, you know, the big man, you know, the, the, the real magnitude of these mortality events. So that there are huge viruses in the way we're reporting and doing surveillance on this disease. Next, please. And um, another factor that is rarely looked into and is very relevant for the conservation world is having baseline information. So for example, in Chile, when they reported on the sea lion events, of course, once you have 30,000 dead sea lions, you don't have to explain much, but originally they had to explain that this was a significant deviation from normal mortality <laughs> expected in that area. And you can see this, how steep that curve was. But again, unless we actually um, fund and, and, and put money into these conservation efforts and monitoring efforts in peacetime, we won't be able to respond adequately when we are facing these outbreaks of this magnitude. Next, please. And this is my, before the last slide, I just wanted to say another really important factor is that if we do not have this data, we can also not understand what this means for these species in the future. So we're working on these models now with elephant seals, for example, so we can model what it means for this population uh, to have lost all the pups in one season. And that is the, the, the squares there. You can see in 2035, the, the, the black and blue lines, if we only lose pups last year, well, by 2035, the population will be back at 2023 levels. But if we actually lost the females on those are the color lines on the bottom of the graph, by 2035, we'll be not, not even close to what we used to be, and it'll be 2070 at least before we are up to the values and the, the numbers in this population before the outbreaks of 2023. And that is considering that we won't have another outbreak again this next coming breeding season. So unless we actually invest in monitoring of these populations long term, we cannot do these models, we cannot do assessments of what this means in terms of the potential for these species to come back. Next, please. And this is my nearly closing slide. So I, I say this, all of this, because the ecosystems and the oceans are critical to our existence. I don't know if anybody's aware, but unless we have phytoplankton, we will not have oxygen and we will not have uh, CO2 and uh, climate change mitigation. The ocean does half of that. It's not only the Amazon forest that does that for us. So tropical forest is very important, but the ocean is equally important. So we need to remember that. And the only reason why we had phytoplankton in the ocean is because we have a food chain that is very complex, that includes krill, that includes whales, that includes all of these marine mammals and all of these seabirds that I, that I, that I talked about. And if we remove those from a single disease outbreak or a single disease that can sustain outbreaks, we will see very significant impacts into the future. And I don't think any of us can foresee what that will mean, but it will likely have very, very important consequences. So next, please. So anyway, I just wanted to bring this message that this is a really big One Health concern. It is a huge uh, planetary crisis for all the reasons that we all know. It is an agricultural disease. Of course, it is zoonotic, but it's also humongously important for conservation. And that will be it. Thank you very much. Marcy, thank you so much for that. A really great, uh, a really great talk. And I have we have a uh, several questions for you. Uh, one will be combined. Um, the the first is that we noticed throughout the talk that you referred to, you didn't refer to it as avian in influenza. And if you could just speak to that. Uh, and then the second one, the second one is part of that. Are there any species that you know of that seem to be more resistant to uh, highly pathog pathogenic or H five than others? So the first, yeah, if you wouldn't mind saying, like, you know, why were you calling it H5, you know, highly pathogenic H5? Yeah, so, uh, you know, these are all influenza A viruses, and we, we kind of, you know, put them in these silos because this is our way of understanding them, and especially because 
when we call them maybe an influenza, then we refer to them as agriculture, um, you know, diseases. Diseases of poultry, and that's why we have the high pathogenicity classification as well. So that refers all to what happens in poultry, but what happens, you know, to all these other species is influenza A virus that naturally moves and has all these different subtypes that are common amongst these other species. What happens is that the highly pathogenic age five, which should have stayed in poultry and we should have eliminated it there, we failed at that and now it's spilled back into wildlife, the gene is out of the bottle and now um, it's unstoppable. Sadly, that's the case. Whether others, where some species are less susceptible, well, yeah, I mean, we, we have some data from what we see. We don't have a lot of studies on that yet. But for example, we saw massive numbers of kelp gulls eating carcasses of infected animals. And we, we saw about 50, Seagulls that got, you know, that died, got sick and died, but there were thousands eating carcasses. So obviously they can do very well with the virus. They cope with it well. Same with the giant petrels in many cases. And actually, interestingly, when we when we swab them, uh, we have uh, lower CT values and feces in those species than in the others where we only find the virus in the brain. So they they seem to shed more fecal orally again, this, this typical cycle of influenza, which makes more sense because if it's in the gut, then it's not systemically infecting them. So we, we need to, that's one of the things that we need to look into a lot more. Okay, we have several more questions for you that we'll save to the end. Before we, before we move on to our next speaker, I wanted to take a moment to <laughs> thank you, Marcy, for calling out marine mammals. I think a lot of times when we think of emerging infectious diseases or things that can affect both humans and wildlife, we think of terrestrial animals and if it's under the ocean, we might not see it, right? But the ocean is in peril. The animals that live in the oceans are in peril. And um, I think it's a really important part of the con conversation. So thank you so much and for speaking with your, uh, your voice too. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so don't go away because at the end, we have got more questions that are piling up for you. Um, Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deborah McCauley. Uh, Deborah is a, a wildlife veterinarian and is the co-founder and the director of VIEW, Veterinary Initiative of Endanger for Endangered Wildlife. Um, Deborah, uh, over to you. Looking forward to hearing your talk. You are muted. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, Marcy, for that excellent talk. Um, I am Dr. Deborah McCauley. I am a wildlife veterinarian, and we founded VIEW Veterinary Initiative for Endangered Wildlife due to the gap that I'll be talking about tonight. Um, you can switch to the next slide. I don't have a lot of slides. I really want to bring home this overall message to you. Thank you for inviting me to speak about um, wildlife health in conservation. Wildlife health is the most unaddressed and under-resourced conservation threat to our endangered wildlife, both in the U.S. and globally. And I'd like to share with you some of the things that we're seeing. While conservation efforts um, to protect endangered wildlife have been focusing on really important issues like anti-poaching and climate change and habitat encroachment, Despite all these efforts, scientists are warning of this sixth mass extinction, and there's an ur urgency to address this decline. There's a missing piece to the conservation efforts, and that's wildlife health. In my lifetime, the human population has doubled in the past 50 years, and the number of agricultural animals has exploded. There's an increase in proximity of people and animals to wildlife, and the intensity of commercial industries are causing the sharing of diseases among people, domestic animals, and wildlife. As we just heard in last talk, there is a highly pathogenic avian influenza, a global epizootic that is now threatening our endangered wildlife. HPAI is filling from birds to mammals, and we are watching carcasses of seals washing up on our beaches, and cattle getting affected in our agricultural industry. Humans and animals are intricately linked to the health of our wildlife. <clears throat> you can switch to the next slide. I witnessed this um, early in my career, and I put these two slides up 
because um, I was working in Montana at Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and we got a call of a bighorn sheep die off. We, uh, we went out into the pastures and I saw an emaciated ram staggering in front of the truck, collapsed and watched him take his last breath. And when we looked up into the pastures, we saw doddering in the pastures, just what you're seeing, dead and dying bighorn sheep. And what we found was a pathogen um, that caused a 90% mortality in the bighorn sheep population. Um, and we also tested the local domestic sheep herd um, and we found the same pathogen causing no sickness whatsoever in the domestic sheep population, but wiping out 90% of the bighorn sheep. This is not just happening in the Rocky Mountains. This picture on the right-hand side is a picture of saiga antelope. A number of years ago, they saw a 70% mortality of saiga antelope, despite conservation efforts to save this critical endangered species from habitat encroachment and anti-poaching measures. And the missing piece is conservation, health. <clears throat> you can switch the slide. So we can no longer take the position to let nature take its course. When it comes to critical species, veterinary medicine should be included into conservation efforts. For example, in Yellowstone National Park, there are four and a half million people driving through Yellowstone National Park annually. And they also come with pets, horses, cattle, and other livestock, leaving the door open for pathogen sharing. But the way health can help, a number of years ago, a bison ranch operation near Yellowstone National Park saw a die-off of up to 60% of their bison herds due to pneumonia, a problem they see in the cattle industry, mycoplasma pneumonia. This could have threatened the bison herd in Yellowstone, but an astute wildlife veterinarian at Ted Turner Ran Ranches identified the cause of death, isolated that herd, developed a vaccine to protect their bison and protect their bison from outbreaks and then implemented a vaccine that also helps bison throughout the US, ranched bison. I'm not saying to treat wildlife like agricultural animals, but what I am saying is that we need to be informed and prepared to protect our fragile populations. And to do that, we must include wildlife veterinarians as part of the conservation team. However, in the US, there are only two wildlife veterinarians for all the national parks, 249 national parks, and there are 11 states with no wildlife veterinarians. And the states that have wildlife veterinarians, there are one or two veterinarians that need to support sometimes hundreds of biologists and state agencies, leaving little time and resources to investigate disease dynamics. I know that there are other federal programs out there and state programs and university programs, but even those are under-resourced. And internationally, they are starting to really understand the importance of veterinary role in conservation, but they're met with more limitations. All too often, there's no energy in the field, poor transportation, limited training, and as Marcy just said, very limited laboratory diagnostic cap capabilities. When a veterinarian is able to get a biological sample, a viable biological sample, and they wanna ship it abroad to a diagnostic laboratory, they're met with a labyrinth of CITES bureaucracy, the very permits that are meant to protect our endangered wildlife moving across international borders from illegal trade is crippling the ability for scientific investigation. So due to these limitations, sometimes conservationists are often left with best guesses or political diagnoses when it comes to answering how an animal dies. For example, I was actually in South Africa last week at a conference, and a head wild veterinarian for an African country is currently having a die-off of elephants. But due to lack of funding, 
or infrastructure and capacity, the diagnosis is still pending. However, in the meantime, someone, a biologist, felt that they needed an answer, and they reported to an international news agency that the elephants died of an algae boom without the evidence to back him up. So often, all too, often guesses become diagnosis, but I know that we can get better than that, absolutely. If a person dies in a hospital, we do a postmortem examination. We understand the cause of death. If one of our critical endangered species die, shouldn't we record their death and identify how they died? But right now, we're not being very strategic. We're not working in sync throughout our national parks and recording mortalities and doing strategic postmortem examinations. Yes, they're being done, but I'm saying routinely and strategically and putting it on a digital surveillance system. We have the ability in our toolkit to stop guessing. And in the US, we are ahead of the game. We are able to overcome some of these hurdles because we have energy and roads and infrastructure and diagnostics. We need to support the wildlife health programs of a, as a fabric as conservation. But what's our biggest hurdle? What's stopping us? Funding. Wildlife health and conservation has been caught between two cracks in funding. There are grants for conservation. There are grants for poaching, habitat encroachment, climate change. There are grants for health and protecting humans and agriculturals from wildlife. In the U.S., there's over five and a half trillion dollars spent in the human health industry and over eight billion dollars in conservation. However, wildlife health in conservation has limited funding, barely any. And we must be able to help support our universities, our states, federal government to include wildlife health in the conservation. And another huge lack that we're seeing in the conservation world is the lack of technology. <clears throat> a digital disease surveillance system, much like in a human hospital, with an electronic medical record system, it is important to understand and improve the management of our information about wildlife health. You can switch. <clears throat> There are solutions. And, and unlike a lot of other conservation issues out there, like climate change and habitat encroachment, which were really difficult, wildlife health actually comes with it the ability to identify problems with possible preventive and treatment measures. Veterinary medicine can take best practices that we've learned in captivity, in zoos, in herd health in field operations and implement them into a comprehensive wildlife health program that prioritizes critical species in key geographic locations and target diseases and other health threats that can wipe out those species by understanding the causes of the die-offs, die putting these measures in place to prevent die-offs. So who, who are we, wildlife veterinarian? view, Veterinary Initiative for Wildlife, Endangered Wildlife. We're veterinarians. We come from the government, academia, and nonprofit sectors to work to address this gap in conservation. Our focus is to solely address the health threats that endangered, endangered species face in their native habitat. Despite limited funding, we are working to build a template to be replicated globally with local partners. We work with universities, local conservation organizations, government, and local communities to find out what their most pressing wildlife health needs are and implement sustainable wildlife health programs. We do this by training, providing education, providing infrastructure. Like in Nepal, we built laboratories, field hospital, as well as a digital surveillance system and help implement research. Our work, we started in Nepal because it was a key geographic location to begin in, in conservation. 
They have a strong conservation effort to protect their critically endangered species in national parks. But it took years of working with government, local universities, and NGO to help with that, the infrastructure and training that our partners needed for a wildlife health program. Now they have wildlife health as an integral part of conservation strategy, and they've built a wildlife health national strategy plan to be implemented throughout their protected areas. You can switch the slide. One other area we saw and we find in wildlife health is there really isn't good digital surveillance system. Technology can help improve time and reduce expenses. To build a system to aid the veterinarians in the field, the researchers and conservation managers and policymakers to begin a better, better information and health threats to our wildlife. A digital surveillance system can help monitor the health of populations, identify emerging threats, track disease outbreaks, and implement target interventions to mitigate health threats to vulnerable species. We must be able to build technology to help science to become more efficient, to help save time and money and improve wildlife populations. You can switch the slide. Thank you. In conclusion, humans are intricately linked to wildlife and the biodiversity that surrounds us. Wildlife around the globe is dwindling very fast. And to reverse this negative trend, we need to act now. If we do nothing, we'll be left with empty quarters. With adequate resources, however, wildlife health and conservation can rise to a new level, and we can really make a difference in, in the recovery of populations. Back in 2011, I also spoke to the American Association of Laboratory Animals. Um, and my talk was similar in that wildlife disease needs to be impacted and included in conservation. Since then, we've barely hit the surface, but we're doing a much better job. Conservation efforts needs to include wildlife health, and we need to be able to provide the people that are in the field with the tools and the infrastructure and the funding to be able to implement them. I hope this conversation starts a talk for a movement to get the funding in the field for conservation to really help wildlife health, to help to turn the, turn the tables, because only then will that improve the people and this planet. Thank you, everybody, for this talk. Amber, thank you so much. That was terrific. We uh, Similarly, we've got some questions for you, so we'll ask two now, and then we'll hold the rest to the end. Would you Great. be able to comment upon uh, your thoughts on uh, the importance of surveillance in wildlife, um, both before or after an outbreak? Is it important for it? To, is it something that should be done on a continual basis? So how do you feel about um, wildlife health surveillance? Well, that, that's the premise of, of our work in that, yes, we need to be able to empower the people on the ground to be able to implement a disease surveillance program before it happens. So if you don't implement a program and give the tools to the people on the ground, the proper techniques of training, providing the infrastructure, then in the face of an outbreak, you won't be able to do anything because you won't be able to know how to take the samples, where to submit the samples. And in the face of an outbreak, do you use a vaccine or do you, do you vaccinate domestic animals? You need to have a proper system in place of a disease surveillance program before a, an outbreak occurs. Okay, thank you. And can you tell us what prompted you to create your organization? Well, the pivotal moment was really seeing um, wildlife dying in the field and understanding and knowing that the, the agencies that are, are working in the wildlife space right now and the funding is really to help protect human and agricultural animals, as well as trophy animals. But critically endangered species, that mandate is not there, and the funding is not there to protect critical species. 
So we're left with great work that's being done by zoos and universities, but what's really important is to implement a program that's grassroots on the ground that includes your local stakeholders because we can't just go in and do a project and leave. We need to give the tools to the local communities in Africa, in Asia, and also our programs in North America that don't have them to be able to continue a, a wildlife health program. Very well said. Thank you. Thank you for your talk and the answers to your questions and stay with us because we've got more for you. Um, and then on to our third speaker. Uh, next, we have the pleasure of, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Karen Bischoff from uh, Cornell University. Karen is a veterinary diagnostician and toxicologist. And um, uh, with that, turning over to Karen. Hi there. Um, so my, I have, I have, oh yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I've tried to kind of, uh, I, I have a rather ambitious, uh, presentation here. Um, I'm going to try to keep down time. So we have, have a lot of time for questions. Um, right, right here. These are a few of the contaminants that I could think of in a short period of time that I worry about. And the ones in big letters are ones that I have probably lost the most sleep over, although some of the ones in small letters I have as well. So uh, I'm not going to tackle all of these. I kind of broke it down into three on the next slide, please. Um, and two of these are things that I deal with most weeks, sometimes every day of the week. Um, and other ones, the the last one, pollinators, is something that I've kind of been, uh, has peak, been perking my interest more recently. Um, but I've been looking at lead poisoning for an awfully long time now. So next slide, please. And I'm going to start with a case study. This is Sam, the American Eagle, who unfortunately was found down and unable to fly. He, um, his talons couldn't he couldn't clutch anything, so he couldn't perch, and he wasn't able to fly. And on radiographs, they found some metal density objects around where his stomach would be in his abdomen, well, in his body cavity. Uh, so next slide, please. So unfortunately, he did not make it. Uh, and when they did a postmortem examination on him, they did find fragments of lead ammunition in his gastrointestinal tract. And when we tested his liver, we have found a 132.6 part per million lead on a dry matter basis, which actually is quite a bit. It's definitely, uh, I would say that that caused the death of this individual. I'm kind of tend to be a little careful, um, but that is not commensurate with living. So, uh, and I kind of in the in the very bottom, the the lightly. Uh, the lightly framed section is a uh, paper that's a little bit dated now about uh, finding lead in most of the eagles in Oregon and California, ranging for actually all of them had from one to a hundred parts per million dry matter lead. I think I, I think it probably gave it in wet weight, and I've converted it, but. The thing was, all of them had lead on board, and that's what I'm mostly seeing. Occasionally, I see um, an eagle, a bird of prey, or something like that that does not have lead on board, and I'm always a little bit surprised because the vast majority of the ones we see, lead may not have killed them, but they have lead. And I, I should say there's some, you know, people talk about reference ranges, reference values for lead. This is the normal value. There is no normal value for lead. It's almost entirely an anthropogenic pollutant. Um, it is part of the Earth's crust. It is found in some parts of the of the world where there's a lot of galena on the surface. But for the most part, the lead that we have, if you go back into polar ice caps and look at cores, it basically stayed started during the Roman Empire. Before that, there was very little lead present in the environment. So we've been using this stuff for a long time. Can you give me the next slide, please? So this is a this is something that just got accepted for publication, some work that we did with opossums. And some of the opossums were uh, wild trapped opossums, and other ones were ones that presented to a wildlife facility for different kinds of diseases. They were debilitated in some way, and somebody caught them and brought them in for treatment. 
And what you will notice here, these are all of the possums we tested. Every single one of them had a had lead on board, whether it was, you know, uh, the wild, the wild ones. Um, and let me see if I can remember which group this is. Um, yeah, the wildlife clinic group is the one that is the first uh, set of data with the 135 being the highest concentration. And I would certainly expect clinical signs potentially over 20 micrograms per deciliter. These are blood samples in this case. Um, usually over 40, I would expect to see clinical signs in even a more resistant animal. Um, and you can see that even in the unaffected animals, we had some pretty high blood lead concentrations. So every animal we tested, where is the lead coming from in these possums? I'm not really sure, but again, it's there and it's caused by us and it's in every animal. Uh, next slide, please. So this just gives me gives you some some ideas of of just a few places where we see lead, where lead comes from in the environment. And we have a lot of legacy lead associated with um, the 1970s and pre 1970s automobile tetraethyl lead, gasoline, um, and that basically has been, you know, when it when it burns up, the lead goes out into the atmosphere. It settles on grasses and soils and things like that. So urban centers tend to have very high concentrations still in the soil. Lead is an element; it's not going anywhere. It really is a forever chemical. Once you put it down somewhere, unless you physically remove it, you are going to have lead there forever. Okay. So lead is always there uh, once you put it somewhere. Uh, we still use lead in gasoline, except not so much for automotive, for the driving, you know, the cars we drive every day, but airline fuel, marine fuel, off-the-road vehicles, tractors, etc. cetera. Uh, paint from the pre-1970s, also quite, a, I mean, quite a bit of lead. It's astonishing. Some of the lead that, we, some of the paint chips that we've looked at have more than 50% uh, lead in them. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much lead are in those paint chips. And again, that's not going anywhere. So if you go into a house, an older house, I live in an 1850s era house, it has lead paint in it. I know it has lead paint in it. How do you get rid of it? That can be really challenging. Because no matter what you do, you're still going to have a whole lot of lead to deal with. So it's customary to power wash some of these buildings. All that does is move the lead from the side of the building onto all the surfaces around the building, whether they be the grass, the soil, etc. So that's actually a major source for a lot of domestic animals. Um, outdoor paints, the stuff they use on our roads, guess what? It still does contain lead because... Lead has properties that make the paint better. Um, and we also see a lot of lead still in automotive battery products. And the other place we see a lot of lead, of course, are in sporting goods. Um, at least in New York, you can't buy like lead fishing sinkers, but there's still lead is still present in some fishing lures. It's still present in a lot of ammunition. It was phased out in the 1990s for use on waterfowl because there were just so many waterfowl fowl die offs associated with lead poisoning. But it's still used for ground birds. It's still used for deer hunting, et cetera. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the photograph of the uh, X-ray, the radiograph, is actually a deer that was killed with a lead bullet. And the cool thing about lead bullets when you shoot a deer is that they explode. And that's actually from a... a from the standpoint of, of killing the animal right away, that's a good thing. They, it, they die quickly. They don't suffer as much. Uh, if you get a good shot, if you know, if, if you get a decent shot in and they won't go very far from the time you shoot them. So you don't have to go chasing them. But look at how much lead is present in the meat of this animal. I and mean, thankfully, we don't we don't really have the, the legs affected. But the other picture, the 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 red blob there is a colorized radiographic image of a sample of venison ground venison taken from a food pantry so we are this is not only a problem for wildlife it's a problem for public health and of course when people shoot deer with lead they take the guts out in situ and leave them there for animals to scavenger scavenge so that could be where my possums are getting it could be from the paint uh, from areas that, where there were a lot of old painted houses, old painted buildings that may or may not still be there, but the lead is still there. So we're not really sure. 
Um, but we do know that from, from some of the testing that's been done, that a lot of the stuff that's found in predatory birds is in fact from lead shot that they ingested, probably from scavenging on hunting piles. Next slide, please. So another topic that I, I deal with a couple, I, I deal with lead um, probably every day. I deal with rodenticides a few times a week. So next slide, please. So there's a whole bunch of different rodenticides out there. Um, the anticoagulants are kind of the poster children for, for a rat poison. So rod rodenticides are basically rat poison, right? So there's a bunch of, they call them the short acting, the first generation, that's kind of a misnomer because they all act in like two to seven days. Okay. So you'll get clinical signs within it, probably about uh, 36 hours. Okay. Whether it's a short acting or a long acting, the difference is how long the stuff stays in the body. So with warfarin, it's going to be gone from the body within about a week. You're not going to have, if you have one ingestion of warfarin and you survive that for a week, you're probably going to be okay. Difacinone and chlorofacinone are they they can hang out in the body for a few weeks. So those they, they're considered short acting, but I don't consider them to have a particularly short half-life. Brodificum stays in the body for years. So one exposure to brodificum and it's gonna stay in your body for years. Now, if it doesn't kill you in the first, if you take one dose and it doesn't kill you in the first week, you're probably not gonna have a problem. But if you're a wild animal that eats and uh, smaller animals that eats rodents, for example, the target species for those rodenticides, and you eat one today that's got some some brodificum in it, and you and it's not a big dose, so you do just fine. And then tomorrow you eat another one that has some brodificum in it. Well, now you've got a bigger dose, but probably still not enough to kill you. But you're doing this every day, or at least a couple times a week. So eventually you get huge doses of brodificum, and that can cause death in these animals. And this the, the neat thing about anticoagulants is they're extremely treatable. We have an antidote for them. The bad part is, you know, the, the wildlife doesn't show up in our clinics to get their antidotes. And when they do show up, we'll give them an antidote and then we'll release them again. And guess what? They're still eating rodents that have this stuff on board. The EPA has come out and made some regulation, tightened some restrictions on some of these, but they are still out there, particularly in rural areas. And then we have a bunch of other ones. Uh, bromethylene is a neurotoxin, very difficult to treat. Cholecalciferol is a high dose of vitamin D, also very difficult to, to, to treat. Strychnine and zinc phosphide are difficult to treat in, in that they, they kill very rapidly. So you don't have time to get to these animals. Um, so those have variable regulations around them. Zinc phosphide is becoming a little bit more common, I think, but definitely bromethylene and cholecalciferol are used a lot. Next slide, please. Um, and the picture, uh, courtesy of Mr. Vickers on the top, is basically showing how these animals are exposed. The, the blue coloring is, so basically this is a, a hawk eating mouse guts. And the blue coloring is the color of the rat bait. So this animal still has rat bait in its stomach that this an that this bird is consuming. This is super duper common. Um, the next picture below it, uh, the, the, the red-tailed hawk, that was pale male's mate. So if you are familiar with pale male, he was found, he was a red-tailed hawk that lived in uh, Central Park for over a decade. Uh, he was, he recently passed away, but he went through several mates and this one died from rat poison. And if you see the, the, uh, the AP photo on the bottom left, that is another celebrity bird of prey. His name was Flaco. He was an owl that got loose from the Central Park Zoo and lived for about a year in Central Park. He was a Eurasian, Eurasian eagle owl, I believe. He lived for about a year in, in Central Park and I kept waiting I kept waiting for him to die of rat poison, unfortunately. And he had more than one thing going on when he died. And there was trauma involved and there was a virus involved. But he, he, from what I've heard, had enough rat poison in him that could have that would have killed him eventually if something else, if those other things even hadn't been there. So it's a problem. Uh, Dr. Stone, about 20 years ago, did a lot of work in New York, found that half of all birds of prey had 
ana- had anticoagulant rodenticides in them, 80% of the great horned owls, 60% of the red tails, and 45% of the screech owls. So I'm not really sure which animals, maybe he was, maybe it was the, uh, the eagles and the um, osprey had a little bit lower because they're more uh, uh, aquatic, an- you know, they eat more aquatic animals, but um, definitely something that, that concerns me. Uh, and then in California, they found it in an awful lot of species, including mammals. And it seems that at low doses, it may cause some immune system impacts in mammals. That hasn't been quite worked out yet, but it may make them susceptible to other diseases such as mange. And then uh, this is an older, well, actually, it's not that old in a paper, but it's been found in birds of prey in California, as well as including the California condor, which is an extremely rare bird. So the next slide, please. And basically every place in the world that they've checked, they've found that the wildlife is loaded with anticoagulant rodenticides. So Europe, Australia, um, and it's been found in predatory birds. It's been found in mammals. And now the recent a recent study coming out of Australia found it in uh, reptiles. And you can see um, the red arrows are showing where the highest concentrations were. And as you might expect, there were high concentrations in rodents and there could be high concentrations in um, snakes that eat rodents. Next slide, please. Now we have this other one called bromethylene that uh, because of the regulations against anticoagulants, which I mean, anticoagulants should be regulated. Now we have this neurotoxin that's very difficult to treat. What's it gonna do to the wildlife populations? I don't know, but it has been detected in hawks and owls in the northeastern United States when people started looking. It has been detected as the cause of death in a black bear in Guelph, uh, Canada. And it has been associated with a poisoning event in feral conures, uh, monk parakeets in California. So it's it might be a problem, time will tell. Next slide, please. So my last topic is one that I'm a little less familiar with, but it's definitely an interesting one. And this one's a little bit different from the stuff I usually deal with because I usually deal with animals that present dead or at least severely debilitated so I can get samples from them. But pollinators, nobody sends me dead pollinators. We'll just put it that way. So next slide, please. So uh, we do know that insects have declined. I was actually a little bit heartened over the past few days. It's been uh, sunny and wet in upstate New York. So when I drive to and from work, there have been lots of bugs splatter on my windshields. Remember back in the day when there were always bugs splatter on your windshields in the summer? Well, it, it's not as common anymore. Um, I have a friend that calls that basically, uh, considers that an epidemiologic method to drive from one part of the country to another and see how many insects that you kill on the way with your car windshield. Next slide, please. So as the poster child for pollinators, of course, I use, this is not a wild species, this is a domestic species, but Apis mellifera, these are the uh, Western honeybees, the ones that are domesticated, they're from Europe, they're prone throughout the United States, et cetera, both as in, among beekeepers and as feral bees. And just so you know, um, there were 2.6 million ton, uh, pounds of honey, or 2.6 million domestic bees, I'm sorry, uh, 112, 25 million pounds of honey a year. So 2.6 million colonies, 125 million pounds of honey, estimated value of 370 million in the US. But that's not the importance of these, okay? That's not the importance of honeybees. Next slide, please. Uh, the importance of honeybees is food security. Okay, they do. Um, honeybees in the United States have a value of eleven point seven billion dollars in pollinating plants, so that we can eat. Okay, an awful lot of the vegetable, fruits, etc., that we eat come from plants that are pollinated by insects, be they honeybees or other animals. Are, uh, which could be bats, could be birds, could be other bees, could be other insects, moths, etc. So about 3 billion of that is from the wild pollinators. 11 billion is from pollination services of honeybees. 
uh, domestic honeybees. And I will say uh, at Cornell, they have done some research where they did not use domestic honeybees to pollinate the apple crops. We have a huge orchard here. And the the wild bees took over and did a great job of it. So uh, if we lose some honeybees, it will be okay as long as we keep our other pollinators, but that's questionable. All right, next slide, please. And the reason that's questionable is because of the amount of pesticides, insecticides, uh, herbicides, fungicides that we use. And we, we don't use one product on a crop. We use a cocktail of different pesticides on these crops. So these bees are being exposed to an awful lot of different things. And I have the, the American Bee Journal clipping that I have is actually from the first reported poisoning event of honeybees in the United States. That was a arsenic product that this guy from Geneva, Illinois sprayed onto his flowering trees. And then he soon found a lot of dead, uh, his basically he killed off his honeybee hive. And the photo um, of the greenscape is actually, I was trying to figure out where exactly this guy lived and that's pretty close uh, because my mom happens to live nearby. So we went looking for, um, for Mr. George Thompson's old territory. And I think it's a park right now in Geneva, Illinois. So why are honeybees and other pollinators potentially more susceptible to pesticides than the target species of insects? Well, number one, they don't metabolize things the same way. The reason that we have metabolic enzymes like the P450s, the reason we develop them is because of natural toxins, right? Plants can't get up and run, so they make toxins to keep the herb herbivores at bay a little bit. Which is, which is, you know, how they protect themselves against, against herbivorous beetles, or herbi herb herbivorous insects, herbivorous uh, mammals, etc. Um, at high doses, these things can be quite toxic. Uh, so herbivores who have to eat huge amounts can't eat huge amounts of specific plants. Bees are different because they are herbivores, but guess what? They don't, they are symbiotic with the plant. The plant wants bees as herbivores to show up, right? Because if the bees didn't show up, they wouldn't be able to pollinate their flowers. So they make nectar for the bees. They make tasty pollen. They bring the bees out. And bees did not adapt to all these plant toxins the same way other other uh, herbivores did, right? Because they don't, the, the, the plants don't put them in, in the stuff that they're trying to bring symbionts in with. They don't put them in the nectar. They don't naturally put them in the pollen. Some insecticides are sprayed. Uh, we do minimize spraying them on flowering trees, so that's really helpful. Some insecticides are systemic, though. So these are the neonicotinoids. They are put on the seeds, and they stay in the plant forever. They are found in the pollen. They are found in, this, in um, the nectar of these plants. So bees are being exposed to them regardless of when they were sprayed because they stay in the plant for a long time. Uh, we are more concerned about insecticides because bees are insects and we are fungicides and herbicides. But it turns out that these can all impact bees in different ways, whether it's from from their microflora and their GI tract, could be from the, the way they store food in their hive. They have symbiotic fungi, so if their pollen they bring home is sprayed with fungicide, is that going to impact the survival of the hive? It, may, it very well may. So I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide. Um, and something that's really interesting, so we think of the liver in mammals, birds, etc. when we think of metabolic organs, the organs that take care of all the toxins that are in our diets from the toxic plants, etc. And bees don't really have a liver, but they have something else called the fat body. And the fat body in this picture from that was actually taken by uh, Dr. Sammy Ramsey, definitely an interesting individual if you get a chance to meet him, uh, is a honeybee body. And all of that yellow stuff in the bottom half of the picture, that spongy looking yellow stuff, that is the fat body. That is the liver of the bee. The pink thing on top of that, that's also filled with that yellow stuff, that is a... Um, a mite that was actually a normal parasite of Asian honeybees that was introduced to European honeybees and has caused a lot of death in them. So the reason that that thing has also felt filled with yellow stuff is because that's what it eats. It eats the liver of the bee pretty much. 
So how does that impact to the way these insects are going to deal with pesticides? We don't really know. Um, it certainly is going to be debilitating for them just to have this giant parasite on them, but also it's cause it's doing damage to the major metabolic organ of the body. Next slide, please. And this is some work that we looked at over the summer. Um, and it just shows these are pesticides that we found in more than 50% of the wax samples from beehives that we sampled. We aren't going to see the neonicotinoids in here because those are water soluble. Wax is going to have more fat soluble pesticides. But one of the ones that kind of rolled me over is piperonyl butoxide, the first one that was in almost every sample. And the reason is that is not an insecticide. It's not an herbicide. It's not a fungicide per se. What it does, it inhibits P450. So they put it in the cocktails with all of these other uh, pesticides to weaken the pests by making them unable to degrade their the, the other toxins. Um, I don't think I've done a very good job of staying staying low, but uh, you can see that the waxes we looked at pesticides, more than 20 different types of residues in many of the hives that we looked at. Uh, commercials are the ones that travel across the country, pollinating your oranges, your blueberries, your almonds. The hobbyists are people that have sh smaller, um, so so the commercial people make all their money with honey pollination services, uh, honeybee pollination services. Hobbyists are the ones that are a small business. Maybe they sell honey at your uh, local farmer's market. I know there's about five of them in my neighborhood. And then the sideliners are basically people that do this or actually uh, ho hobbyists, I'm sorry, are the ones that that do this on, as a hobby. They just have some bees at their home that they, you you know, kind of keep just for fun. Sideliners are the ones that are selling at your, at your farmer's markets. So the next couple slides are just some of the references. If you can click through those slowly, um, and I will uh, end here. Thank you. Sorry, Karen, I was muted. Wow, so uh, thank you for that. And it seems like there are an uh, incredible array of threats to, you know, uh, to wildlife from different contaminants. Um, we do have a few, uh, two questions to ask now, and then again, uh, one later on. The first one is, can you, uh, can you uh, address any or the, what are the indirect health effects on wild animals from lead poisoning and other contaminants, whether it is a higher susceptibility to diseases or predation or impaired reproduction? So can you talk about the indirect health effects of contaminants and especially lead? It's a good it's a good question. And I wish I knew the answers. There was a recent paper out of uh, from some the people that live next door to me at Cornell, who uh, found that, yeah, we do see lead in every eagle. Um, and they found that it probably has a 4%, causes a 4% decrease in um, eagle population sizes. So it, it's actually pretty horrifying to see an eagle with lead poisoning. It's, it's really distressing. So from an individual basis, just from a, a humane basis, it's really hard to tolerate. But the subclinical things, we really don't know. We know that in humans, um, you know, it may impact behavior at even very, I mean, the CDC says there is no acceptable dose for lead in children. Any blood to lead concentration is considered significant. Tiny concentrations are associated with behavioral changes. They're associated with decreased um, intelligence, potentially, um, Eventually, they may have heart disease. Eventually, they may, they may have kidney disease. We don't test wildlife for that stuff. So even, you know, subclinical exposures with lead may make this animal less fit for survival. It may make the animal less able to hunt. It may make the animal less able to reproduce. I mean, we know that from back in the day with DDT, right? It wasn't, DDT didn't kill eagles. It just made them so that they couldn't reproduce. And that was, that was the problem. So impacts we really don't know we're kind of learning them as we go along um and i would say with pollinators those neonics generally don't kill bees overtly but they change their behavior and bees have to go and find something they have to go out to a remote location they have to find stuff they have to bring it back to the hive they have to communicate where they found it to the other bees so that they know where to go 
And if you're impacting those things, how does that affect that bee's life cycle? And how does that affect a hive in general and their ability to forage? So we don't know. Um, probably bad. It's probably bad, but we just haven't got enough science because nobody's really looked that hard. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. And Karen, you might not know the answer to this one yet either, but so what's the answer? Like, what do we do with all this? You know, uh, how do you get, how do you translate the information that you're gathering to uh, action to public policy to share with others. So uh, take that in any order that you want. But the the short answer, the short question is, what's the answer? Like, <laughs> what what do we do next? It's hard because humans are hard on the environment. I mean, if we don't use insecticides, then we have other problems, right? We may not have enough food. The food that we have can be contaminated with mold, and that can be toxic as well. Um, I mean, one, one of the big carcinogens out there is a, is a mold toxin produced on corn and a lot of other grains. So there's mm -hmm. a reason that we use these products and, you know, how do we, how do we control them? Well, there's a lot of policy changes that need to happen. We need to consider our pollinators, which we haven't been historically. Um, and as far as lead, you know, there have been regulations, the changes from leaded gasoline to unleaded gasoline decreased the soil the the spread of lead contamination around urban centers the uh change from non lead paint to lead paint or for, I'm sorry the other way the say reverse that from leaded paint to non leaded paint has actually diminished the amount of childhood exposures to lead that is out there but it's still out there because we used it and it's very very difficult to remediate um, so we we're coming, we're, we're making baby steps. Now, as far as lead is concerned, um, removing it from sporting goods would be great. <laughs> um, there are problems with that as well, because you don't get as good a kill rate. Some of the equipment may not be designed to deal with other metals, but it's certainly something that would, that would help minimize exposure to wildlife. I actually have a guy in my laboratory who's back over there. Um, that is a, an avid hunter. And he worked in my lab for one year and stopped using lead ammunition because he couldn't stand it anymore. So those are some suggestions. So maybe it's a, also a public awareness thing as well. Correct. Right. Uh, same with, uh, Karen, thanks for the talk. Stay with us because we've got more questions for you and we're on to our, uh, next and final, but not least speaker. Uh, Dr. Eric Hoffmeister from USGS is a research virologist and he'll be discussing about uh, he'll be discussing several things, including climate change. Uh, over to you, Eric. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so on the agenda is the talk is the effects of climate change on wildlife health. I'm going to use a case study on the evidence of exposure to vector-borne diseases in snowshoe hares captured in northern uh, Michigan as an example of um, of this. I'd like to first thank some collaborators, Eric Clark, who's a biologist at the Inland Fish and Wildlife Department of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, Dan Greer, an ecologist here at our center, and Melissa Lund, technician at our center, the National Wild Wildlife Health Center. I'm going to be giving some general comments on the effect of climate change on wildlife health, why snowshoe hares were chosen for this Sura survey, the survey findings, and then some conclusions. Uh, next, please. So the alter climate change is projected to alter critical habitats, and they can be uh, widespread and very dramatic, such as coral bleaching, which is shown in this photograph, but they can also be very covert. So uh, an example of that might be as um, the sand warms around a sea turtle's nest, what that is producing is a, um, a favoring toward female development of the embryos as opposed to a more mixed uh, equal sexed outcome. Changes in animal density and distribution are projected with animals projected to migrate uh, to higher latitudes and also higher elevations. There can be a limitation on food resources and that can be direct where the climate is, is affecting the food stuff itself or indirect, which is brings in the concept of phenology, where, for instance, a migrating bird might arrive at a uh, stopover and find that the food has not matured and it's not ready for consumption. 
or it has already passed. There can be changes in the survival or distribution of intermediate host or disease vectors. And so I'm, what I'm showing here in the bottom right is, um, uh, sorry, the te text may be very small, but it's three panels. The bottom is low elevation, middle is mid elevation, and the top one is high elevation. Along the x-axis is the years from 2010 to, to the end of the century. And the y-axis for each one of those panels is the probability of infection of Hawaiian forest birds with avian malaria, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. So you can see at the current time on the bottom panel uh, into the future, basically there's a 100% probability of infection uh, with avian malaria at low elevations. This is about 400 meters and uh, lower. At mid elevations, it's not 100% at present. And you can see as time goes on in the century, that's going to rise toward 100%. At the top elevation, the high elevation, you can see by mid-century that uh, probability of infection with avian malaria is rising. The three different curves in the middle and top panel are whatever ch climate ch change scenario is chosen for these um, this modeling. And the reason this is happening is that te as temperatures warm, the ability of mosquitoes to survive at increasingly higher elevations is occurring. Okay, next one. So before I talk about the snowshoe hares, I need to first talk about the Anishinaabe nations. So, so on the left is a map of the uh, Great Lakes region. The Anishinaabe are a collection of tribes who migrated down the, uh, I guess it would be up the St. Lawrence River uh, westward and settled as far east as Ottawa and Toronto and as far west as Winnipeg. On the bottom right is the historical distribution of snowshoe hares in North America. And then that small offset panel shows that in that region that the Anishinaabe settled, snowshoe hares were very common. And this, this resulted in the Anishinaabe actually having a strong spiritual connection with the snowshoe hares Culturally, they're very important. They're also, they've also been used for, or been valued for subsistence. They are hunted. Snowshoe hares are also recognized in, at the base of the food chain for mesomammals in these areas, such as for lynx, bobcats, um, foxes, and uh, wolves. Okay, next one. This shows the estimated snowshoe hare harvest by Sioux tribal hunters 2011 through 2021. It was brought to tribal leaders that there was a declining number of snowshoe hares that were harvested starting in about 2013. Next one. This led to a vulnerability assessment in the Eastern UP of Michigan in 2014. This was conducted by the uh, Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, by the Applied Forest and Wildlife Ecology Lab at uh, Michigan State University, the Michigan DNR, and the USDA Forest Service. Uh, next one. The vulner vulnerabil vulnerability assessment used this tool, the system for assessing vulnerability of a species to climate change. And this is a USDA forest tool. Assessed are the adaptive capacity, and that's the species ability to re reduce exposure or sensitivity. The exposure itself, and that's the degree climate change would affect the species. And the sensitivity, and that's the degree to which such exposure might actually cause risk. As criteria that are assessed are habitat, physiology, phenology, biologic interactions. And the sole purpose of this really was to develop a tribal adaptive management program. So in the upper right photo there, that's the snowshoe hare in its long day length uh, uh, coat brown, they're brown rabbits, brown hares. The bottom right is the short day length color of these uh, snowshoe hares. And I'll, I'll bring this up a little bit later. This is entirely determined by day length and not by temperature. Uh, next one, please. The assessment results were that snowshoe hares are moderately to highly susceptible to climate change throughout the century. And again, this range is based on whatever climate change scenario is plugged into these, this assessment. The most vulnerable categories were habitat, 
The tree species used for cover or food are expected to decline. Uh, snowshoe hares prefer scrub shrub habitat, and that's uh, shown here in the photo. And also of concern are biotic interactions, such as emerging diseases and competitors. Okay, next one, please. So the goals of the tribe were to develop a spatially explicit snowshoe hare density predictions. And from that, they could relate the probability of finding hares with features of the landscape, the, the uh, flora and landform. And the other goal was to develop a baseline of disease exposure, uh, current disease exposure. And that's where our lab came into the picture. The map in the middle shows the distribution of snowshoe hares throughout Michigan. You can see that they're actually found in lower Michigan, but they're found throughout the UP of Michigan. So the UP is bordered on the west by um, the northeastern part of Wisconsin, by the north, Lake Superior, by the south, uh, Lake uh, Michigan, and on the east, by, by Lake Huron. So it is truly a peninsula. The map on the right shows further studies that were carried out by the tribe in these two areas of the Hiawatha National Forest in the UP of Michigan, in the, in the extreme east part. So uh, 20 capture sites were stratified, and by site, I mean lo actually location, because each site had multiple capture sites present. They were stratified to include US Forest Service ecological land types, and an ecological land type is a way to describe the geology, the landform itself, the soils, and the flora and fauna of an area. Okay, next one, please. Uh, in, shown in this photo is Eric Clark, the biologist at the uh, Sault Ste. Marie tribe uh, with an assistant, and they're anesthetizing a captured hare. So in 2016 and 2017, snowshoe hares were live captured. They were anesthetized in the field and a blood sample was collected. A suite of environmental data was collected on vegetation variables at, at each capture, capture location. 66 hares were captured and 47 were successfully bled for serology for vector transmitted disease reported in either hares or rabbits in North America. Uh, next one, please. So our lab looked for antibodies to uh, these agents, snowshoe hare virus, Jamestown Canyon virus, silver water virus, lacrosse encephalitis virus, West Nile virus, Borrelia burgdorferi, Powassan virus, and Francisella tularensis. Uh, Powassan, Borrelia, and silver water are all tick transmitted. Francisella tularensis tends to be fly transmission or wounding in the case of a hunter. Uh, the rest of the viruses are um, mosquito transmitted. We found uh, 24 of the 47 hares had antibodies on screening level to snowshoe hare virus, and those were confirmed by a secondary, more uh, specific test. Three were found uh, screening positive for J Jamestown Town Canyon virus. One was confirmed, and one hare was uh, found confirmed with silver water virus. Two were screening positive for West Nile virus, but uh, failed on a more uh, stringent uh, assay. Uh, with the exception of silver water virus, all of these are known zoonotic disease agents, and I'll mention something about that a little bit later. Okay, next one, please. Among the snowshoe hares that were snowshoe hare virus positive, there was an association with an increased weight and that probably is a proxy for age. The, the longer you're there on the environment, the more likely you are to be exposed. There also was an association, a strong association with uh, ecological land types 70 and 80. 70 consists of cedar, mixed swamp, conifers, tamarack, and balsam fir, whereas 80 is a little bit more uh, upland, but it's still a forested wetland with black spruce and tamarack. Um, next one, please. So the Ciro survey conclusions, it's, it's difficult to determine in a two-year study whether climate change is affecting the exposure of snowshoe hares to vector-borne diseases in the UP. But it does set, set a benchmark for future study. And our first, first speaker mentioned the importance of a benchmark. Without it, you really, uh, it, unless something is dramatic, such as the death of those uh, seal pups, uh, you don't know that something is actually happening. 
Studies of this type are critical for determining the longer term effects of climate change on wildlife health. For instance, long term data sets in the range of snowshoe hares in Wisconsin found contraction of the range in 2014 as compared to the range in 1980 by an average of 29 kilometers. The map on the right shows in red the contracted former range and in um, gray the, the range that was present there in uh, 2014. The photo on the right is where I, what I'd like to bring your attention back to. This is a, an example of a phenological mismatch between a white uh, hair and no snow cover. So this is going to lead most likely to increased predation of hares in the winter. And um, other ecologists also feel that increasing temperatures in general might be driving the contraction of the range of snowshoe hares. Okay, next one, please. Um, an important concept here is that vectors are likely to respond to climate change much, much faster than hosts and may, maybe the pathogens as well. So while I, was, while I started out talking about this as a the effect of climate change on wildlife disease, this is essentially a one health issue. And under wildlife health there and uh, also human health, uh, climate change may very well change the thermal and moisture, uh, uh, not the ability of the vectors to withstand uh, that, but the climate, the, what is keeping them at bay now, say cold winters in the UP, might relax and allow uh, vectors and, and uh, to, to survive better. In terms of the ecosystem, there's the tribe is uh, uh, working to uh, address the habitat structure and that will hopefully protect, protect the population dynamics of the snowshoe hares on these uh, preferred ecosystems. Uh, the next one. We see an opportunity to work uh, together, uh, different agencies and sectors to collect, create collaborations that break down traditional silos. For instance, the Sioux tribe is very interested in a culturally and recreationally important species. The USGS can help apply expertise to provide new information to support and manage wildlife health. And the US Forest Service can help the tribe to manage and respond to, uh, to create a more sustainable for forest management. This uh, banner across the bottom is actually a, a newspaper of the Chippewa Indians. And in their language, uh, that it says one who understands, that's the name of the uh, newspaper. But what it's doing there is it's announcing the partnership of the Sioux tribe with Hiawatha Forest, which is essentially managed by the US Forest Service. And with that, uh, next one. Thank you. There we go. Um, hi, Eric. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate your um, your approach, and I really really like that the um, the idea of bringing into uh, the local communities into discussions around wildlife health and survival really important. Um, would you be able to comment? We've got yeah, a few questions for you, but then uh, I'll ask two, and then we'll circle back to the broader ones to the team. Would you be able to comment on the importance of the hares to the Ashinaabe tribe and uh, how how what what role the, these animals play in their within the community? I actually confess that I I could only give a a very weak uh, bit of information about the importance. Um, I have through this work in talking with Eric Clark. I have really appreciated appreciated the the spiritual importance of of the snowshoe here. An example also might be um, we have very other uh, icons that we revere, such as sage grouse in the west or bighorn sheep. But I don't think that we have the spiritual connection that the Anishinaabe have with snowshoe hares. I understand. Um... Okay, and uh, when we were talking earlier about the data that's being collected, how will the data be? Uh, what is when that data is shared with the tribe? How will, how will that data be utilized? What the the um, adaptive management program for the tribe really is going to consist of uh, modifying the landscape, and 
what has been done for probably centuries has been the use of fire to regenerate the landscape. And I think the tribe, with the assistance of the U.S. Forest Service, is going to bring back fire as a method of rejuvenating the landscapes to landscape that's preferable to the snowshoe hares. Mm, I see. Um, well, thank you very much for that. I think your photo of the uh, the hare in white plumage or white, you know, um, fur in the middle with no snow is really striking. It's a, a testament to what climate change and that the, where you started with the coral, coral bleaching as well, all really visual um, examples of things that we need to be concerned about. Um, so thank you for that. This concludes for our team. This this uh, concludes the the lecture section. Now we're going to go on to question and answer. Um, before we go on to the question and answers, um, I wanted to give a uh, a big comment that this was a really uh, broad discussion on all the issues that can affect wildlife health and survival. Everything from infectious agents to contaminants, talk and funding challenges as well. And I think we've done a great job of outlining the uh, many different and disparate threats to wildlife. Um, and um, and in reference to that, I'd like to thank all of you for the work that you do, what you, you what you've dedicated your lives to so far. Um, it's really critical, and um, so heartfelt thank you from every from myself, but every everyone else as well for the work you're doing. Please please continue. Part of our goal here is also to find out ways in which we can. Uh, best help bring some of the critical issues forward. So many, many thanks. Um, in terms of questions that have come in online, I'm going to, uh, Marcy, we'll, we'll circle back to you. One of the questions was, um, oh, can you comment upon, um, uh, well, we've, we've seen transmission between uh, uh, marine mammals and birds. It appears that carnivores are not uh, yet as affected. Is that so? And do you have any thoughts? Why not? You mean in South America? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so we have had no cases that we know of in carnivores. So the implications of that, uh, which are sustained by our molecular findings on our phylogeny of the viruses, is that the virus has evolved and it's now moving around in the marine mammals and it doesn't need to eat something that is infected to become sick. So... It's just a change in transmission, which is what we keep on discussing. And we don't kind of want to pin it down because it, it gets complicated there. But um, elephant seal pups uh, that died were, you know, sometimes the, the counterfacting here works. So elephant seal pups that died uh, range from zero to 21 days. That's when they win in three weeks. They only nurse uh, from their moms. So they only eat milk. They have no teeth. And moms are only on the beach when they have their pups. So 17,000 elephant seal pups did not eat infected birds. It doesn't make any ecological sense. So that's another part of this story. So we need the molecular studies in conjunction with the ecological context and knowing our species to understand you know, how these mechanisms work. And of course, then you know, we'll make it more robust with the necessary science. But we can't do experiments in the wild, so we have to learn what we can from these events. Right. Uh, another one for you, Marcy, before we move on this. Um, UC Davis is is uh, is uh, been involved in many, many different wildlife studies uh, globally. Could you describe uh, the, the role that you see that universities have, like you see, such as UC Davis have, uh, what they can play, what they should be playing? Um, yeah. In wildlife health, both in, you know, surveillance, but addressing uh, outbreaks. Yeah, and I would say worldwide, um, I, I I worked many years, 20 years actually in an um, um, NGO, so the not-for-profit world. And I think it was interesting for me when I when I switched to academia, that uh, from one day to the next, I, I gained a different level of um, credibility. And then also I was less antagonistic in meetings. So when I saw when I, I I was sitting in meetings and having conversations as an NGO, you're perceived as with an agenda. And when you come from academia, you're just discussing science, even though I did exactly the same thing in both of these contexts. But uh, so it's been that's interesting. 
Uh, but aside, so, I mean, academia has a real role in terms of, you know, making the science accessible, as long as you get to that next stage where you actually, as our last speaker was saying, uh, you know, uh, when you actually bring it back to the communities and you use the science for something, I think that for me is really relevant. But then, of course, also, you know, without without the academic settings where we can, you know, get all the, the, the next generations enthused about this and you know, speak to to the new issues. And, and and it's really, I mean, for me also, it's been really important in terms of uh, adjusting, right? If if we're in our own worlds and our own jobs and, and don't have the frequent contact with the newer uh, generations, then we lose touch a little bit of what is, is driving them. Um, mm -hmm. So I, that is really helpful as well. You, you're, you know, teaching and everything, you're constantly challenged by the expectations of, of the of the younger people. And I think that is really uh healthy for all of us, right? We have to we have to learn um what they need and we have to respond and then we have to help them be prepared for their challenges, which you know we fail on many. So <laughs> we're leaving them a heavy lift. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I love that description of, of that. Karen, as part of a uh, uh, Cornell University, do you have a uh, do you have similar thoughts? Well, I was just thinking toward the end there how much the, the students keep me on my toes every day. It's, uh, of course, and I think we share this with Davis. We have some of the best students in the entire world, the most, the most um, intelligent and uh, caring, compassionate, empathetic human beings on the planet. And honestly, most of my students are way smarter than me. So it's always hard to kind of, it's always a struggle <laughs> to try to stay ahead of them. But um, I haven't spent a lot of time. Uh, yeah, I definitely have been accused of having agenda, uh, even though I haven't really spent a lot of time outside of academia. Um, but yeah, I think I think having the platform of academia um, does bring you a certain level of of attention that you might not otherwise get. Yeah. And, you know, I started out by saying that, you know, thanking all of you guys for the incredible work that you've done, but we all need to be able to, you know, pass, you know, create that um, sustainability and continuity and build, you know, build capacity in the next generation of scientists to continue this important work. So uh, yeah, yes, yay for, uh, for universities. Um, Eric, I'm going to ask you a question in just a minute about um, your, the, 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 same, the same question about from the government perspective. But first, I wanted to circle back to uh, Deborah. Deborah, you've just recently published published an article at um, World Economic F uh, Forum. Would you mind commenting on that and sharing bits and pieces of that with the audience and with the teams? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, it was the kind of premise of what I talked about today. In that, um, is is that we do need to include wildlife health and conservation. That um, that we are underfunded and we need to be able to look at private and public ways to find funding. And so um, in order to support our programs globally as well, you know, not just the United States, but on a low global scale, these efforts that are happening, um, you know, I, I touched on avian influenza, these rewilding efforts need to have wildlife health, it needs to be included in the conservation efforts. And um, we need to be able to create sustainable programs that um, that really is sustainable. And and touching one of the things as well, um, I did I did touch about a uh, digital surveillance system. And, and to carry on from what you guys are talking about, our youth need you know are very digital. And what wildlife health um, really does is often, you know, they'll print out something or put something on an Excel print sheet and there's no dynamic um, on a digital system. And our youth really don't understand that, you know, <laughs> like looking at a file cabinet of, of paper, we need to be able to get um, advance our technology in, in parallel with our science to be able to speak to, to the youth. And, and so that's some of the things that I discussed. I think that it's terrific, and I also think that um, we, we, we want to look at wildlife health for the sake of wildlife, because you know, these animals deserve to survive on this planet as well. But another way of monetizing it, right, is if we're not paying attention to, if we're not looking at the 
wildlife human interface, it, there's a lot of huge cost to hu human lives and human suffering. So that's another way of um, sort of the, looking at the economics of it. There's got to be a financial component there's, uh, to, uh, to invest in and financial reasons also to investing in wildlife. And I think you meant you've done that very well in your um, and last point, just to know that to keep our wildlife healthy, um, you know, in these in these um, our endangered wildlife help improve economies, and a lot tourism is a number one um, economic driver in a lot of these countries, and they you know go to see your wildlife, and it's important to keep endangered wildlife healthy to help improve the economies of these countries as well. So it's all you know the whole biodiversity ecosystem. Go ahead, you have mm -hmm. a couple. Yep, yep, very well said. Um, you brought up a really important point. I'm going to ask this to any any of the members of, uh, on the panel. Uh, what does the future hold for us as we try to answer some or just some of these issues? I mean, certainly artificial intelligence. There's many different ways that we can be harnessing this for the future. Do any uh, uh, and this is for any of you? Um, do any of you see ways in which we can incorporate AI to help protect wildlife populations? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, in order to, to, to develop a digital surveillance system, you need to have AI. And, um, and that is incredibly helpful. We've been working with uh, a holistic state agency to develop the digital surveillance system. We're working with UC Davis on a research project um, to develop that arm of the, of the digital surveillance system, as well as, um, as well as working with state and federal agencies in the US to have that collaborative work. And you can't do it without having AI support that and work with that, but it's really important. Um, I, I mean, that was the, wasn't that we were planning on bu building a system, it's just that it was such a need um, and it's gonna help save money, time, and um, and because veterinarians and researchers are so limited, we need to be able to help support their work. And, um, and I think AI, can do that. Yep, indeed. Um, there was a, this is a question for Karen. There was a question around uh, what what are the regulations and concerns around uh, concerns around all of the pop up pest management companies doing private property mosquito spraying on po on pollinators or insectivores? Uh, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, I just got the window that said, you are muted. Um, sorry about that. That's an excellent question. And it's a really hard one to answer because um, there are regulations on how a lot of these can be handled. And from an agricultural standpoint, there are outreach organizations that kind of communicate between beekeepers and agriculturalists as far as when they're going to spray, what pesticides they're going to use, when they're going to use them so that beekeepers can keep their bees inside when the, the worst of the spring is going on, which is, you know, fabulous um, and important. They don't really have that for smaller level pest control companies. Um, and as we're doing more urban agriculture, which is fantastic, as we're bringing more honeybees in, the you know the risk for you know spraying for public health impacting honeybees and for urban contaminants impacting honeybees is probably going to be much greater and i will say uh back remember before before the big pandemic with covid and um and h5n1 and all that stuff well actually h5n1 has been around for a while but um we had that zika virus thing remember that one of the problems that came up was that the people who were spraying for mosquitoes to control Zika virus, they didn't know anything about these, these networks to tell beekeepers. So they just killed off an awful lot of colonies. A lot of um, beekeepers were basically put out of business from the mosquito spraying. And of course, this is, this is managed pollinators. All of the pollinators out in the world are on their own, you know? Um, there's really no way of, of dealing with that. I will say that as problems come up, we have been managing them. For example, remember when they had, if, if you go to the, if you go to the, um, garden store, you used to be able to buy, to buy these, um, butterfly weeds and pollinator 
weeds that are supposed to bring pollinators into your into your um, yard. And for a while, they were having them insect resistant. And what that meant was they were giving them neonics, neonicotinoid <laughs> pesticides to put out in your, you know, in your garden so that they wouldn't get eaten by beetle, you know, um, Japanese beetles and, th and, and locusts and things like that. Well, guess what? They were also poisoning the pollinators. So that's actually been moved back. We're not doing that as much anymore. Um, they can't sell those products anymore. And I don't know if it's voluntary or if it's legal. So I think, I think communication between the different sectors, the different stakeholders, is going to be super, super mission critical. And if I can add something about academic, about the academic institutions, specifically veterinary colleges, I think something that's going to happen that we're going to need to have happen. And, and one of the things Cornell has been working on is bringing a one health perspective more into and a one and a planetary health perspective more into the veterinary curriculum because um people come in here and they don't know what a veterinarian can do i mean everybody kind of thinks that we vaccinate chihuahuas and cats and we do that but we also do regulatory medicine we do toxicology we do diagnostics we do all of these other things that contribute to the public health and the public well-being and just getting our students on board with that um, so that we can better represent ourselves as the public health people that we are, as the one health people that we are, is something that I think all that schools are going to need to get on board with. You know, uh, thank you, Karen, because it really does take a village, right? And we spoke about that the other day, that initially when the concept of one health was uh, floated a long time ago now, it was the, the idea that of the intersection between human health, uh, animal health, and environment, and I think it's really more to take a much broader approach, a, a interdisciplinary approach, at least that's the way I look at it, to say there's no one way of getting to the, the um, there's not one right path to contrib contribute. I think you guys have all shown many different paths that can contribute and still overlap and support each other and leverage for the greater good. So uh, I, added, I, think, I mean, One Health has been around since Aristotle. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah. it's been around uh, a long time and it kind of waxes and wanes, but um, we need to get out of our silos, basically. Yeah, and I think people are, you know, I, at least I, 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 that's my experience. Um, Dr. Barbara Madison Horowitz has her hand up. Sorry, I didn't see that, Barbara. Up to, uh, over to you. N Let's see. Okay, great. So what a, what a phenomenal um, panel. I mean, this was an extraordinary kind of sweep of infectious threats and contaminant threats to, um, to animal health. And I guess um, when we talked about contaminants, when um, Dr. Bischoff, you were talking really about acute contaminants and you know acute exposures and um, the infectious, the, most of the um, threats to wildlife that um, Dr. McCauley, you were talking about were also really infectious. But um, given the, you know, now, the pr increasingly um, strong evidence that climate change is significantly is raising rates of hematologic cancer, certain hematologic cancers, infertility, or at least reduced fertility in both women and men, um, chronic kidney disease. So these more chronic kinds of situations, do does the instrumentation exist? Is there in in the in the system that we have today, would these things be picked up um, as the cause of uh, not a mass mortality event, which would be sort of easier to kind of trace? But if 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 the same kind of effects on kidney function, let's say, are happening in wildlife uh, that are comparably exposed to climate change, who would spot these trends? And I mean, educate me about how chronic exposures um, might be detected and, and their impact on wildlife health. And that could go out to anybody. Well, I can say one of the issues that we do run into with these types of situations is that animals don't get very, wild animals don't get very far into the progression of these of these chronic diseases before they get picked off, right? <laughs> it, it it impacts their ability to survive long before it would overtly cause death. So that's, and that's something that we really don't 
understand. We we can't really we don't really have a way of figuring out would this would this eagle have lived longer if it had not had subclinical lead poisoning, right? Don't know. Um the other thing is there has been some studies, particularly in aquatic animals. Um I'm talking probably marine mammals are a big one. So orcas and the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, suckerfish in Lake Superior, um, that they have seen increased uh, risk of, of various um, potentially carcinogen induced diseases in some of these guys. So I'll just throw that out there um, and then recede because this is not my area. Marcy, your hands up. Yes, thank you. So, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna actually um, many things. So, for example, it, it is extremely talking to what Dr. McCauley was saying. I mean, it's this is why we need surveillance, and this is why it has to continue over time. And there are very few efforts that actually have this sustained, you know, that are actually um, sustained over a very long periods. So, I have a program that I've sustained for twenty years now working on southern right whale. So this is a baleen whale. It doesn't eat, you know, it's not one at the top of the food chain. It's actually at the bottom of the food chain. It eats um, plankton mostly. But, um, you know, when you start looking deeper into these creatures, because they have a thick blubber layer, you know, a lot of all the lipid, uh, lipid friendly, fat friendly um, contaminants go there and get stored. You know, you can see things interestingly over time. So for example, looking at some you know, of the common um, PCBs and all of those, and even now the plasticizers that we're increasingly finding all of the plastic contaminants that we haven't even mentioned today. So you find them, it's interesting because you start looking at and it's like, well, mom uh, gets rid of a lot of contaminants through her milk. She feeds them to calf. Baby is full of contaminants early on in life. And then when you look at the males and the population in comparison, they're loaded because they don't have the milk system to get rid of it. So there's a lot of that, you know, some studies out there already showing some of these impacts. And I'll finish with an example done from, because I was gonna say that the other great source of information are usually rehab centers, right? Rehab facilities, uh, when they have a good health system attached. The key example for the marine mammal world is the Marine Mammal Center in California. And for example, the, some of the work that they've done there and they published are incredible studies looking at um, cancer that they've detected in uh, California sea lions. And we rarely see uh, cancer in wildlife because as um, Catherine was saying, I, I mean, they die, right? I mean, they, they get picked out of the ecosystem. We don't, they don't survive. So, um, but they were seeing cancer in California sea lions and they were able to trace that back with amazing science to high exposure to contaminants. There were a lot of, when DDT was banned in, the, in California, it was dumped into the ocean in barrels and that is actually leaking out now. And there's all very well documented. Uh, so these guys are loaded wow. with PCBs, DDT and all of the whatever metabolites and they have high levels of cancer and they also have high levels of infection with herpes, herpes virus. So they have this specific combo where you know you have animals that are immune suppressed because of the chronic exposure to contaminants. They uh, get infected with herpes viruses that probably have a role in and also triggering some of these cancers. So there's some great papers out there that that clearly show this. There are very few examples because again we we rarely have access to animals that live long enough to have to show chronic disease. I mean, normally they will get wiped out of the ecosystem by predators. All right, so I'm going to actually close down the questions now. We have several more coming in, but we are um, running out of time. I wanted to close with saying um, that the types of questions that are coming in, we might need to do another forum uh, that are everything from looking at animal uh, movements and tra uh, tracking land connectivity, trans the value of translocations and international training programs and capacity building, the role of uh, and, uh, NGOs as well as government agencies. So we have um, and the importance of sampling for surveillance. Um, uh, so there is, um, uh, the, uh, we, we've done what we, I think we hope to, uh, hope to. we've generated a lot of questions and, and shared a lot of knowledge. 
Uh, I'd like to end again by thanking our really fabulous panel and thanking the co-chairs of Baskar for uh, initiating this to begin with. And of course, um, uh, Mariah for, make, for making it happen. So thank you to everybody. Um, take a quick break and we'll see you at 315.